thank you, thank you so much. Um, what um, Al was saying in terms of the staff, um, today I heard that um, the agencies have been asked to do cuts of 2.5% more. So enforcement in all areas will be lacking because the state doesn't have enough funding for the amount of um, inspectors, enforcers, uh, et cetera, that we need. Um, also, in terms of what Deborah said, you know, some people think, well, New York City is taken care of because our watershed is taken care of, so we're not gonna, going to really give a hoot about what happens in upstate. And in that case, they're very wrong because the people in this city are well-educated, well-informed, and don't just care about what's in their backyard. They care about the environment in the state as a whole. And that's why I think we have so many people here and why people are so interested in this issue, because they care what happens to the environment and they care what happens in this great state of ours. So um, I'm glad that we have the resources, because it is a 1,000 pages to read. So I wouldn't advise that. Um, <laughs> But you know the websites, and there are other places where you can where you can read more about it. So we're going to go one, two, three, and then one, two, three. Yes. Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Eugene Shapiro. I'm a retiree from the motion picture and TV industry, and uh, I come from a world where it's the not what you see and what you hear, but what you feel that counts more than anything. So the other day I happened to see Gasland, mm -hmm. and there was nothing more impressive to me than the fact that the very brave cameraman director walked up to the kitchen sink, pulled out a match, <laughs> put it up to the water, and what happened? It burst in flames, it exploded in front of him. Some of my colleagues who know more about this than I do said to me, you know, they feel that the word fracking is misspelled, that it's not <laughs> F-R-A-C-K-I-N-G, but that it's really S-U-I-C-I-D-E, suicide. Now, I don't know, maybe uh, they're exaggerating. I haven't heard exactly something that would make that explicit, but perhaps you wish to comment on the fact that we have witnessed in our years in the industry things that have been fixed, things that have been recuperated from, but they feel that this, the reason they use the word suicide, means that once you destroy the water system, that's it. Now, are they exaggerating? I, does this really add up to destroying the water system? I'm asking that as a question. The important point about fracking is that it could destroy a water system, it could do so very quickly. And even if we can't say, well, the water system will be destroyed, any risk to a system like this is completely unacceptable. It still boggles my mind that there were serious people in Albany who proposed it. Can I, can I just add one thing to that? The, you know, the industry, as, as Al mentioned, says that there's no documented uh, cases of groundwater contamination from fracking because of this huge distance between the shale deposit and the, and the, and the, and the aquifers. But what they don't tell you is that um, there, you know, the, the only thing that is preventing the contamination right now is the, the casing and the cementing of the wells. Now, we've already heard about all the problems we've had with the casing and cementing that allow methane migration. But the, nobody anywhere will tell you, if they're at least honest, that cement lasts forever. Mm -hmm. So even if we, we can forestall this for a while, we have no idea what this, where this millions of gallons of contaminated water is going, to go, is going to migrate over time. And as that cement degrades in its natural process, that well itself is a migratory pathway up into the water table. So it's just a matter of time, right? If you don't care about your grandchildren or future generations, then maybe it looks to you like everything's perfectly fine. But there is nothing that will stop things from migrating over time, um, it, it, whether through natural fissures, the fractures that are created 
by the fracking itself or earthquakes in our region, or whether it's through the wells themselves. Uh, Bati Luton Coalition for a Livable West Side. First, I want to say Lauren said that our th three fabulous speakers will be on YouTube, so we'll be able to have our friends see what they said. I think that's fabulous. Yeah. The Coalition for a Livable West Side <clears throat> believes that hydrofracking should be banned in all of New York State. On October 14th, the New York State Department of Environmental Conser Conservation canceled the scheduled hydrofracking advisory panel meeting. Four of the agencies that had to issue reports couldn't do it, and so they canceled the meeting. Um, their demands on 1,400 new wells in New York is ridiculous. The US EPA is only midway through a major safety study due uh, in preliminary form in late 2012. But unbelievably, in an interview on August 9th, the commissioner of New York's DEC, Joe Mar Martins, said he was confident that underground com uh, contamination from hydraulic fracturing was not a risk and that the EPA agency study of fracking would not yield any new information. Why is New York State DEC unwilling to wait for the EPA study? Thanks to ProPublica.com, a 24-year-old EPA report was discovered that adds to a list of examples of how water supplies are polluted in natural gas drilling areas and provides the strongest articulation yet by federal officials that fracking has caused contamination, a study from 25, 24 years ago. And it remains to be seen whether natural gas delivers environmental benefits, such as reduced emissions of carbon dioxide when burned, given that it in itself is a potent greenhouse gas if it escapes during drilling or pipeline operations, a so-called fugitive emission. Governor Cuomo, don't count on the fracking tax revenues in your 2012 budget. The fight to ban hydrofracking in New York State continues unabated. Is, it, is that a question? Um, hi, my name is Scott Austin. I'm just a resident down the road here. Um, most of my information is coming from Gasland, which I've seen a number of times. I, 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 is this a discrepancy? or Because in the, in the documentary, they say there's 596 plus chemicals. And I heard you say 336. 596 is the national number. 336 is the number cited for New York. OK. Either way, it's a lot. Because <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> that's what I didn't hear too much of a discussion about tonight is that in the documentary that seemed the most shocking to me. And when he went and got uh, and tested the water from the produced water that they call it, and and um, and the result, the you know all the 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 responses from people in all the different states and the effects that it was having on their health not just the headaches, but um, they were talking about tumors. Um, my question is, is, is the, that Halliburton loophole, is that still there? That they, so that, that can't ever be um, reversed? Well, the Halliburton loophole is unfortunately live and well. Um, that, there is the bill that I mentioned in Congress to close it. It's called the FRAC Act. The Fracturing Responsibility and Awareness of Chemicals Act. What it does is actually um, put hydraulic fracturing back into the scope of the Safe Drinking Water Act so that there is an underground injection control permit required when there's fracking. Right now, there is such a permit required only if there's fracking with diesel fuels. The industry, of course, told us for years they were no longer using diesel fuels. Congress issued some information requests and subpoenas and found out, in fact, they've been lying to us and that, in fact, there have been th tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel fuel used in fracking without complying with the Safe Drinking Water Act. This is another area where um, EPA is now taking action on its own to provide new guidance on what is going to be required if the industry does frack with diesel fuel. But the only way that we're going to close that loophole is through congressional action. And um, so we, we need to be very active on other fronts right now because the you know, the, the likelihood that we're going to see that loophole closed anytime soon is pretty remote.
that was, that was something catched in the Bush White House with um, Cheney um, to, to have the chemicals be proprietary information so that they would not have to reveal to the public exactly which ones they were using. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Reale, and I have a confession to make. I like cooking with gas. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it actually makes me want to ask you a question, which is, if I and if we as consumers were to go to our energy suppliers, or if you as legislators were able to write a law that said we had the option to purchase natural gas, that was not from hydrofracking. Is the market structured in that way that we can insist to get only gas from direct drilling or whatever the regular technique is? No. And the short answer is no. Oops. 90% of oil and gas wells are fracked. Okay, 90%. The only technically feasible, economically feasible way to get the gas out right now is through fracking. I see. Both, v vertical and horizontal wells, 90% are fracked. Yeah, I might, I might mention that the reason the gas companies have embraced so eagerly gas fracking is the traditional sources of natural gas, which were either as part of an oil recovery, in fact, the natural gas used to be used to bring up the oil, or in, the, you know, in, these, ca in these cavern captures, have been steadily declining. Mm. Um, partially because of extraction of oil and just partially because it's an unusual geologic formation. 90% of the future natural gas will be frac gas. So now there are, there are some interesting possibilities with synthetic gas that may even be biofuel in terms of those of us, myself included, who mm. like cooking with gas. <laughs> My other short question is, is it possible to not use the chemicals and just pump water into the ground and still, and ha still have the process work? No. The reason, the, the, and this pro probably, people like myself should probably explain this more carefully. If you put sand into water, what happens? It sinks. Since the sand is what's doing the dirty work, something has to be added. No, just hold it like this. Closer. <laughs> How deep? Uh, the, something has to be done to hold the sand in solution. Okay. That means adding a chemical with the specific gravity, to use the hydraulic term, of sand so the sand stays in solution long enough mm. to float. There's no technical reason that I know of you could not develop a green fracking fluid. GE in Canada is eagerly attempting to do this. But I would point out that even if you could get a green fracking fluid, there's all of these pollutants you bring up from the shale, plus there's all the landscape damage you do. So it would certainly be an improvement to have green fracking fluid. And the EU is actually also trying to push this. But it doesn't really change the fundamental dynamic. Thank you. Okay, first of all, I want to thank you so much for having this panel and for raising public awareness, and I hope that that continues and grows a great deal. And, um, oh, and my name is Barbara Kataiman, a resident here, and I'm originally from Canada where we use hydropower, so um, I'm very much in favor of alternative types of um, energy and not being dependent on lunatics like Chavez and Iran or other places. But um, uh, what I wanted to say was, um, isn't it also possible to intensify our efforts to have uh, better legislation for compliance with uh, major clean air and clean water acts so that if it really is something that we can use as a resource, that it's you know, done in a way that's totally prote protected with very rigorous standards? Yes, we, I think we all agree that compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and the other statutes for which oil and gas drilling have been exempted would be a good thing. And this FRAC Act uh, introduced by Congressman Hinchy, uh, Congressman Nadler as a co-sponsor, all the, all the right people are behind it, 
Uh, unfortunately, it's got a really uphill battle, at least in the current Congress. That doesn't mean we shouldn't keep pushing, but we can't count on that right now. Good evening, my name is Mark Diller. I'm the chair of Community Board 7. Um, and we're also very grateful for having this opportunity to uh, discuss this important issue and for your leadership, Linda. Um, we have a resolution hot off the presses. Uh, it was adopted last night by the Community Board. Community Board 7, by the way, is the Upper West Side of Manhattan from 59th to 110th Street west of the park, um, which was adopted by our full board with a vote of 33 to 0 to 1 to 0. Uh, the 1 proves that it really was West Siders who were voting. Um, <laughs> Um, and it summarizes the, um, the effects that have already been adequately summarized by this expert panel, so I won't repeat them. Although the news that there's a distinction to be made between hy um, hydraulic drilling that is partially horizontal and partially vertical and only horizontal, uh, only vertical is, good, is additional new news and we're, we'll take that into account when it comes time to testify. Um, the conclusion, uh, shockingly, is that we asked Governor Cuomo and the DEC to ban hydrofracking um, at this time, unless and until the concerns that are all mentioned above have been adequately addressed and that we resolve to ask the governor and the DEC to focus their efforts on reducing the demand for hydrocarbon fuels, including natural gas, by encouraging energy conservation and efficiency and supporting the development of non-polluting alternative energy sources such as wind, solar, and hydropower. which leads me to believe that the community board is in fact speaking for our community, which is terrific. Um, I guess the only question that comes out of that is, um, since the resolution asks for uh, a ban unless and until we can address all the environmental issues, is there any way in which we can feasibly, responsibly address all these issues? It sounds like there are too many. I think you already said that, the, that we can't address the, the cleaning of the water which without investing more resources than it would take to make it economically feasible. Is there, um, I mean, is, is there a redress that we could possibly hope for? Now, what I typically would say, we can do a lot better on water quality and air quality um, and protecting the public health, <clears throat> but there's absolutely nothing that you're ever going to do about the landscape impacts and the industrialization of our areas, which right now are, de are dependent on are surviving and flourishing on sustainable industries like agriculture and tourism and recreation. So, you know, my answer to that is, you know, granted there is no perfect energy source that's perfectly clean, but, you know, this is one that's going to ravage the state if it's allowed to go forward, even if we don't have a, you know, a single drop of water polluted, which is certainly not going to happen. You know, there, there is a, a release into, into water supplies in Colorado on the average every five days from this industry. Um, so I, th I think that, you know, looking at it broadly and from the perspective of the, of the character of the communities upstate, um, there's no way really to protect them against this industry fully. Um, I guess we'll proceed with the next uh, speaker who I think is yeah, you. Yeah, it's a tough act to follow, but uh, <laughs> never had to speak after a movie star. But uh, <laughs> so... Yeah, I'm here. My name is Andrew Brockman. I'm here representing Manhattan Community Board 1, which represents Lower Manhattan. And just like CB7, thank you. You know, we agree with CB7. We agree with this panel. We think that everything, you know, you, you've been saying, all these risks are of grave concern. Uh, and since for the past couple years, we've been passing resolutions with regards to this issue. First, we wanted out of New York City watershed. Luckily, we got that. Uh, most recently, we asked for uh, an extension of this 60-day period to 90 days because we don't believe that 60 days to review a 1,000-page environmental impact statement is nearly sufficient. Um, so, so we believe more time for public comment is necessary. And um, thank you. <laughs> and also, um, you know, we just think that this proposal places an unnecessary and unconscionable risk on all New Yorkers that it, it only limits drilling to within a thousand feet of tunnels and aqueducts that deliver water to our city, despite the fact that New York City requested a seven mile buffer zone, that the lack of an adequate buffer zone between drilling and New York City's aqueducts combined with the lack of wastewater treatment plants that accept gas drilling water 
underscore the importance of holding more public hearings and extending the period we have to review this long and complex document. So thank you, and thank you for doing what you're doing. Hello, uh, my name is Olive Freud. I'm with the Committee for Environmentally Sound Development. And for over a year now, our committee and the Sierra Club have been doing everything we could. We called meetings also, not as big as this, but uh, we have been very much anti-fracking. Uh, Fracking is horrible. We've got to just eliminate it. Uh, but what do we do for energy? I was glad to hear what you had to say. But I wanted to say this. Last Sunday at Occupy Wall Street, all the environmental uh, groups got together uh, to talk about energy. We don't like uh, fracking. We don't like um, Indian Point. But we do like, and there were 100 yellow balloons out like this with the sun on it, it's calling for solar energy. So we made our speech there. I wanted to ask Linda in particular. New York State is a little bit behind in uh, helping the energy process and, and the legislation for helping uh, solar energy get its footing. Uh, New Jersey had a better law. Uh, California has a better law. And I just wanted to hear, is anything going on in the legislation that you know about? And if there isn't, let's get going. Yes, actually, I mean, I am in the assembly, so I'm partisan, but the assembly has passed legislation on solar. I agree that the state has not done enough, but it's been very difficult with the, the Senate and the assembly um, not agreeing in philosophy on issues like fracking and uh, regulations and producing new ways to power our society. So. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be having a newsletter soon and I can, I'll point out the different bills that we have. For example, on fracking, we've passed a, a passel of bills. The Senate just doesn't take them up. So we have to urge our legislators across the state to, to pay attention. I mean, they... I, I wanted New York to subsidize solar energy in a real concrete way. Well, I mean, way. we really have to use solar energy. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I agree. We're behind. It's embarrassing. Um, but that's one of the things we'll be pushing hard for when we go back in January. Good. So I hope all of you will join in that effort because it truly is important. People will say, well, if you want, if you want to get rid of uh, fracking and you want to get rid of coal, you want to get rid of nuclear, uh, what are you going to have? And there are many options. As uh, Al said, we can, we can turn green. We just have to put our, our mind to it. So thank you for mentioning that. Hi, um, my name is John Breitbart. I'm a Upper West Side resident. I'm not representing any groups, although I do belong to a tradition of activism that goes back to a group called the Shad Alliance in the late 70s that opposed the creation of the nuclear power plant at Shoreham, Long Island, uh, successfully. Um, and I'm here to raise a point that in those days we raised a lot, which was that the only way the nuclear power industry got going in the United States was for the federal government to accept liability for the potential damage in the event of a meltdown. It was called, it was a little discussed and presented piece of legislation called the Price-Anderson Act, which put a ceiling, a limit, on the liability of the power industry uh, in the event of a meltdown. And it seems to me, and I'd like to ask this as a question, it seems to me that if these ba the energy companies, these, these bloodthirsty bandits, uh, were told that they could only um, sign, create leases with landowners if they accept full liability for the complete loss of value of those lands in the event of, uh, of problems. So is there a way to use the law and use legal liability to hold these companies fully responsible for the potential costs of their activities? Um, yes, no, and maybe. The, um, there's a lot of stuff that is breaking surface about 
the impacts on mortgage and housing values of gas leases. And I think you're going to see a lot of activity on that in the future. But we also need to be sure that gas companies are in the chain of joint and several liability for Superfund sites under the state law. And the fact the courts have not been very friendly in looking at, you know, just general nuisance kinds of things. And whereas I actually would argue that under zoning power, <coughs> localities already have the ability to regulate this. I think DiNapoli is right that there needs to be an impact fund so that not only landowners but local governments can recover the costs as you have suggested. Could, could, state, could state legislation place that liability directly on the companies themselves? Yes. Yes, yes, definitely. It's just a matter of passing it in both houses and having the governor sign it. It's, a, it's an easy process if we all agree, but we don't all agree. Hello, my name is David Zellman, and uh, I want to join the chorus who have been congratulating Linda on putting this together. So again, thank you. Um, I was at a meeting of uh, security analysts who specialize in the oil and gas industry, and they basically said what uh, Mr. Appleton said, which is, this is not a profit-making venture. It's not a profit-making venture if you have to follow the law. So then I thought to myself, well, what would Roger Ailes advise Linda to do? Um, and I think that what, what he would advise Linda to do is walk over to one of the people who are opposed to this and say, you know, I'm really for hydrofracking. Just, just need to tweak it a little bit. Like, for example, we, we need a law saying that you, you can't drill unless you let us know what the mixture is. And, and you can't drill unless you have an approved disposal site. Um, all trucks should be hybrid. Um, and I think that um, you have to say, okay, well, I know that jobs are very, very important. And I, and I agree with you, and I really think that they are important, but we just need to put these few acts into place. Um, I also uh, want to take this opportunity to say that uh, in addition what you've basically done, hopefully, is, is take, your, take a leadership role. We need to see you in the media publicizing this and, and really turning this into something that people buy into because it's right. Hi, uh, my name is Jeremy Talent. I'm a resident of uh, Inwood, which uh, the ultra, ultra Upper West Side or upstate Manhattan, as some people have called it, much to my amusement. Um, but uh, uh, so basically, I'm glad that, uh, you know, thanks to all the speakers, and I'm glad Assemblywoman Rosenthal touched briefly on the uh, upstate, downstate divide, which is certainly formative, I think, in New York, <laughs> the New York State history. Um, recently, but uh, and, and so one thing I want to highlight, you know, regarding the the watershed and the New York City watershed, and so this is a quote from the, you know, uh, the uh, draft number two supplemental generic environmental impact statement, the uh, yeah DSGEIS. Uh, uh, so regarding the exception for the the New York City and the smaller geographical area of the Syracuse watershed, that so they're accepting these areas, they say, because these areas present unique issues that primarily stem from the fact that are unfiltered water supplies that depend on strict land use and development controls to ensure the water quality is protected. That's, you know, very wise, I think. And that certainly describes the water that I grew up drinking, not in New York City, about 45 minutes northeast of Cooperstown, off mentioned tonight, in upstate New York from the private well that I drank from, as did all of my neighbors, as do, I believe, most rural residents of New York State that are not part of municipal water supplies that have some degree of protection under this, you know, environmental impact statement. So to me, I think this kind of illustrates this two-handed approach to the DEC, and I feel, it feels to me like they're using this divide to appease the people who might be more vocal or more powerful or have more access down here. And meanwhile, rubber stamp, you know, hydrofracking in the areas that it's going to happen in anyway. And so, you know, and I, I see this throughout the, the DSGEIS. They say, 
you know, there's inherent risk to the water quality, but we think with some protections, in most cases, we can maybe, you know, so there's a lot of a kind of a qualifying there. Um, they say, you know, we're going to make the chemicals publicly known, except the ones that are industry secrets. So there's this kind of like double speak. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear, uh, you know, from any of the speakers if their kind of uh, feeling about the way the DEC is approaching this is similar, or they could offer any insight into, you know, what, what is exactly the DEC doing? I, you know, before reading this, I would have thought of them as a scientific organization, and uh, it seems really, in fact, to be much more of a political organization after reading sections of their support that I can make it through. So, I'd say two things to that. One is, there are a lot of good people at DEC who are really worried about this. And honestly, when I saw the first draft of the environmental impact statement, it was so bad, I thought that there was actually internal sabotage. The people were setting it up so that we could successfully challenge it if they were actually approved. Um, you know, that being said, um, there are also a lot of people there who think they've been doing a really great job of regulating this industry for a long time, and this is a lot of fear-mongering. Um, and the document itself, I think, you know, reflects both sides um, within the industry. You know, one thing that I, I would say is that, you know, the one is that it really does bear taking a look closely, if you can, at some of the, uh, some of the document. I wouldn't ask anybody to read through all 1,000 pages, but we, we have been just trying to figure out what would this mean if there was an actual build-out to the level that they describe in the economic analysis. Because if you look through the EIS, it's very difficult to tell really what they're talking about at all. And so I think when you talk about this doublespeak, you know, it's, it's often just really clear, unclear about what the scale of development is supposed to be. But when they do the economic analysis, I want to show you how great it's going to be in terms of jobs and, and revenues. All of a sudden, they've got all of this laid out. And so if you actually map it out onto a county, and figure out how many wells they're, they're talking about and how many wells are needed on their own assumptions to actually drain every square inch of the state where the, where the shale play is, they're projecting twice as many wells as they really need. And so, you know, I, my, my concern about this here is not that there's necessarily doublespeak, but I think that they've been getting a lot of information unquestioned from the industry and it just doesn't hold water. And so the more we can point out these contradictions and consistencies and, and ambiguities, the better it will be, the better chance we will have to challenge this if they ever actually get to the point that they approve the EIS. So keep pushing on it. Ethan Rubin, former president of New York City Friends of Clearwater. I want to thank the Assemblywoman and her colleagues for passing a bill to ban fracking in New York State. I think that's a start. I think um, we have to keep doing what our group is doing, which is Article writings, article writings for our Enviroblur newspaper, petitioning, letter writing, and we have to flood the government with the people's opinions because unfortunately in this country there's a power grab going on and it it's started in 2005 with the National Energy Act and the four waivers that gave the Halliburton loophole, but it also continued in the Obama administration with the Citizen United versus Federal Election Commission U.S. Supreme Court ruling that says unlimited campaign financing. So that means the corporations can basically twist the arms of everybody who's elected to office and they can get what they want. And you know, I actually really don't hate corporations. I'm not against capitalism, but I don't like the way these corporations are working. I think unfortunately, uh, Occupy Wall Street has a lot of anger about 99% of us who do not control the wealth in this country, who do not control the, the, the safety measures for our sustainability, for our children's sustainability, and I don't like it. I, I marched 12 days ago at um, 11 o'clock at night down to 59th Street. I think that's, that Occupy Wall Street is really right to be angry about the economy and the economics of this country. But most importantly, most importantly with regard to fracking, which is a very scary concept, we are being not considered stakeholders in our own water supply. Now the water issue is a worldwide issue. That's the third highest commodity sold on the world market. I believe the woman's name is Arena Salinas. She wrote this, she, she produced this movie called For Love of Water. It shows that for a woman, her whole day's labor is to pick, is to get clean vases of water and bring it to her family so that, that her family can survive. It's not a joke. It's not really a joke, sir. I, uh, I, you know, unfortunately, we may have to do that in this country, actually. 
And that, that, that's the problem with why it's not a joke, because the, the corporations, and I have a list of the corporations prepared to, to, to profit off of our uh, health problems. And <clears throat> fracking, uses, fracking uses and gives off arsenic, radon, benzene, methane, and they're keeping, we're stakeholders in this too. I mean, yes, we elect our government, but we're, the people are stakeholders in what's going on here as well. And if they're keeping 66% of the chemicals out of the public domain, I don't think that that's democracy. I think that's corporate fascism, actually. And I think the corporations think they can control us and think they can tell us what to do. And I don't think it's right. And I don't think it's right, especially since in Dimock, Pennsylvania, and Dish, Texas, there have been problems, essentially, with the, um, OK. <laughs> I think, Jonathan, I think you should uh, definitely testify at the DEC hearing. Um, which, for those of you who don't, who, it's November 30th at um, 199 Chamber Street. It's the Tribeca Performing Arts Center, 199 Chamber Street. And you could take the 123 ACE to Chamber Street or the Artist City Hall. And this is for Wednesday, November 30th from 1 to 4 and 6 to 9, where you can um, give your testimony for the DEC, um, and they have to listen to you, as Deborah Goldberg said. <laughs>